live in a globally connected world. It's a global world that's run by globalists who are collectively referred to as uh, the New World Order, the Great Reset. Um, they're actually, uh, this group is actually to be equated with the harlot, Mystery Babylon, in the book of Revelation. The harlot and the beast, as I've mentioned before, they're two different entities. Uh, the harlot rides the beast. She controls him. He does not like that. And at the time of the abomination of desolation, which is at the sixth trumpet, that's when the beast and the ten kings, uh, four angels who are bound at the river Euphrates, plus a 200 million man army, are going to uh, put down this system that's been in control since the time of Babel. And this system that has now basically come out in the open, telling us exactly what their plans are for humanity. During the first century, uh, we had what was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. We had uh, all roads lead to Rome. We had the Roman road system. This was a sort of a one world empire that had a kind of a peace that the Romans enforced, and there was this um, road work, this uh, connection of Roman roads that connected the known world at that time. So Christ was born into this setting of a sort of a global empire um, with a lot of connectivity between cities and towns and a kind of a peace that allowed for uh, the communication and spread of the gospel throughout the whole known world after Christ died, was resurrected, and then gave this commission to his apostles to spread uh, the good news of salvation throughout the world from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. During the last days, we can sort of expect that some of the things that happened at the first coming of Christ would sort of cycle back again, would circle back and uh, sort of reappear in a larger way. And that's kind of what we have right now. Instead of uh, Rome being the little global empire, what we actually have now is a true global world where everybody is connected, not via roads, but via the internet and, um, you know, Twitter and <laughs> cell phones and so on and so forth. We are a very connected global world. And the globalists uh, who've uh, sort of been behind all this connection, they're the ones who are really in control of kings right now, which is what the book of Revelation tells us is the role of the harlot. She is actually over kings. She's over commerce. She's over the ships of the sea, the container ships that can either travel or not travel, the trucks that can either move goods and um, produce and stuff throughout uh the world and countries, uh, they control all of that. And the, the harlot, the, the New World Order, the Great Reset people, what they want to do is usher in a world that is controllable. So in order to do that, of course, you have to have a, um, a lowering of the number of people that are to be controlled. And so there is a depopulation agenda at work. I know there are people who say this is conspiracy, but it's not because these people are actually saying these things and they're making it happen. Right now, I believe that the forces of evil that are wanting to destroy people, either through a, a um, orchestrated famine, through wars, through pestilence, through diseases, so on and so forth, that they are pushing their agenda forward as far as they can take it. They're meeting some pushback, though, in the form of four angels who are, according to Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, they're holding back the four winds. The winds, in this case, uh, sort of harken back to Daniel chapter 7, where it talks about the winds stirring up the great sea, and out of the great sea come four beasts, and, of course, the last beast is the, the one that we're expecting, the beast who is going to um, rule and be the Antichrist person. These four angels are right now holding back 
what the New World Order people would like to do. They're not allowing it to go forward as quickly as they would like it to. They have an agenda and they want to move it forward as fast as possible. Christ is in control of all of this stuff. He is God's representative. He's God's agent, as it were. He is the one who is going to basically open seals and uh, allow the events that are in Revelation to unfold. He is the one who is controlling all of these things. But he has, of course, you know, these four angels who are under him who have to obey him and they have they're going to continue to restrain what the mystery Babylon people are doing until the 144,000 of Israel are sealed. So the famine, the wars, the peace being taken from the earth, the pestilence, the disease, the scare, scarcity that we see is escalating all over the world. But it can only go so far until we're in heaven, until that first rapture has taken place. And once the 144,000 are sealed over that seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, and then on the eighth day, uh, that's when our ministry here on earth is going to end and will be taken into heaven in a rapture. Before we leave in the rapture, though, we're going to have you know, a seven-day warning, but it's more than just a warning. It's an actual passing of the baton from basically what's been considered a Gentile church back to Israel again. So Israel is going to uh, receive that baton. The, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on these people. We're going to be helping uh, to pray for them, uh, to impart that Holy Spirit life to them. Uh, we have authority to do that. It's something that's been given to us as believers. We're going to have that extra measure of the Holy Spirit. We will pray for people on earth. And then after that, then we will leave. The seven days that the male child has to wait before he can um, have the flesh cut away, receive his new name and be presented to God. So that's the imagery that we see in Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> that's um, part of the, the symbolism for a male child being born. So once the 144,000 are sealed, Christ will take the scroll and begin opening the seals. And I think that the first four seals are going to be opened like right away in immediate succession. So all of a sudden, all of the things that these four angels have been holding back, these winds or these spirits, uh, that these uh, four angels have been holding back from the four corners of the earth will actually uh, be unleashed. The pressure will be released and they will just move forward. That's when the beast, the seventh king, the rider and the white horse will come out. Peace will be taken from the earth. There will be famine and pestilences. And the result of all this will be that death reigns um, and these seals influence a quarter of the earth's population. Now, in spite of all this, believers are going to be full of joy because that's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. Uh, you are full of joy. The, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. So in spite of the fact that all of these things are going to be taking place, um, seals one through four, trumpets actually one through four will be taking place uh, on the eighth day, they'll, the effects of those will be released immediately. It doesn't matter because the people, believers, are going to be full of joy in the Holy Spirit. So in uh, Revelation chapter 10, we see Christ as the mighty angel. He's coming down from heaven. He's taking possession, authority over uh people, believers who have died and over believers who are living, he's going to take them as his prey, which is why he roars like a lion. The Holy Spirit, the seven spirits that are um, before the throne of God are going to thunder, and there's going to be this interaction between Christ and the Holy Spirit, which I believe will result in the glorification, rapture and glorification of believers and the resurrection of believers as well, dead Believers who are, um, their spirits are in heaven, they'll receive their glorified bodies and be presented to God. 
So this is going to be a time of joy for us going into heaven, but it's also going to be a time of joy for people who are on earth who have received Christ. A uh, time of wonderful joy and fullness and love and so on. In Revelation chapter 10, John is told to eat a, uh, the little scroll that's in this mighty angel's hand. He eats it, it's sweet in his mouth and then bitter in his stomach. And then he's told that he must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, and tongues, and so on. And then uh, we go into chapter 11 where we read about the two witnesses and we see uh, a temple being built and the temple goes from being the temple of God in the holy city to Sodom and Egypt with the Antichrist, the beast, defiling the temple of God. So what's going to happen is there's going to be tremendous joy on the part of believers. They're going to be full of joy uh, talking to people. Um, people are going to get saved and converted. There's going to be millions of people who get saved uh, during this time period before the abomination, which is right here. So over the course of about six months, there's going to be a huge, huge, gigantic revival. And there's going to be like waves to this revival. So the first wave is going to be, you know, start back here when we pray for people, for the 144,000 and they get sealed. And then there's more people, uh, Jews and Gentiles, who get saved over the course of the seals and trumpets this uh, point in time right here and this is about um, this is about one month okay so if this happens over tabernacles um, the time between tabernacles and Passover which is you know about when this stuff happens here is like six months all right so we know that the sixth trumpet is going to sound and that is going to be at the same time as the abomination of desolation. We know Satan will have been cast out of heaven before then, basically on first fruits. And we know that uh, before Satan is cast out of heaven, that there are actually martyrs in heaven. But the beast hasn't started to reign yet. He doesn't start till over here. So we know that the martyrs who are present in heaven are martyrs of the harlot. The harlot is the one who's drunk with the blood of the saints, and she is going to be killing believers over on this, uh, on this side of the abomination of desolation. Even though this sounds really terrible for believers, they're going to have that extra infilling of the Holy Spirit so that they will gladly lay down their life for Christ. This is, I don't want to say it's going to be a happy thing, but it's not the horror that... Um, that people want to make martyrdom to be like this is like the worst thing that could ever happen to you. It's going to be limited basically to 10 days. Now there's going to be hard times, you know, as the seals are opened and there's, um, you know, shortages and peace is taken from the earth and that's going to affect believers who are um, on the earth at that time. But they still have the resources that are connected with the Holy Spirit inside of them. All right, so this is the sixth trumpet over here at the time of the abomination. Uh, the ten days of persecution are going to be uh, just before um, this time. Uh, the ten days will end on first fruits. Now, we've got trumpets one through four, which are going to cause some devastating earth changes over a third of the earth. And we've got the sixth trumpet right here at the time of the abomination. It means that we have to still talk about the fifth trumpet. And that's when a, an angel falls from heaven and opens the bottomless pit and releases these angels who uh, John describes them in symbolic terms in Revelation chapter 9. Uh, he's going to be releasing these entities, but we know they're angels. We know that they have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit who is Apollyon. Okay, Apollyon is that fallen angel, the worst of the worst of the worst, who is going to be um, indwelling the beast once the beast rises from the dead. The beast is going to 
be killed over here at, around Passover and rise from the dead on first fruits. And Apollyon is going to indwell him. In order for Apollyon to indwell the beast, he, the pit actually has to be opened before, um, before the beast begins to reign over here. So the fifth trumpet is going to be blown, according to this scenario that I see, about um, uh, a couple of weeks after our rapture. So if we're raptured this year, for example, in 2022, and it doesn't have to be this year, it can be any other year, um, and all these day counts and stuff still apply, but they'll apply to a different year. So if it's not this year, they can apply to 2023. So we're not looking for specific dates as much as we're looking to count day counts. And we actually are incorporating Feasts of the Lord in with what we're doing here. The Harvest Festival, specifically um, the Feast of Tabernacles, which isn't something that we celebrate. But we're going to be um, following the pattern of the seven days with an eighth day, the, the, the child who's caught up, the leper who is cleansed, the, the priest who has seven days of ordination and then ministers on the eighth day. All those patterns apply to us. So the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, though, will apply to the 144,000 of Israel who will be sealed over the course of that week. So if the first rapture takes place on the eighth day of Tabernacles, that would be um, October 19th of this year. 2022. Okay, and I'm writing this the way Americans write it <laughs> with the month first. If that's the case, um, the fifth trumpet would most likely be on November the 8th, which happens to be a full moon, and there actually is a lunar eclipse that day, a full lunar eclipse visible in Israel. So if the fifth trumpet is opened on this day, and we count 150 days or five months, we'll end up at first fruits in 2023. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about CERN and the opening of the pit because today is July 5th and CERN has just powered up again. And a lot of people think that because um, on the website for CERN, they're they're trying to open a portal, okay? And a lot of people think that this is uh, how the pit is going to be opened is through something like CERN. Now, that may be the instrument that God uses to open the pit, but the pit is going to be opened on a day that's already predetermined, okay? So nobody is going to open that pit, CERN or nobody, until uh, Jesus basically gives the go-ahead. Now, Jesus is the one who is basically God's steward. He's the firstborn. He is over all of God's household, which means he has the keys to everything. So he has the keys to death and Hades. He has the keys to heaven. He has the key to the pit. He has the keys to everything. He opens doors that no man can shut. He shuts doors that no one can open. So Jesus is in control of all of this. Okay, there is none of this that's outside of his control as God's steward. Now we know that once the pit is opened, that the entities that are in the pit, these fallen angels, and I believe they're the angels that uh, mated with human women uh, at the time just prior to the flood and had children that they, um, the Bible calls the Nephilim, they are the um, their hybrid offspring and they were killed at, at the time of the flood the spirits of the nephilim became the demons and we know that it's the demons who um, the harlot is looking for demons and is inhabited by demons she dwells in the wilderness that um, you know the woman is in the wilderness which is the habitation of demons she doesn't give up her worship of demons once uh, she uh, the big destruction happens and she'll continue to worship demons and so on until the uh, bowl judgments. The fifth trumpet, the pit is going to be opened and these entities are going to come out and they're described symbolically. Uh, one of the things that uh, John says about these entities and they're, they're angels, they're fallen beings, he says that they have hair like women. Okay, hair is is seductive okay in 
the the symbolism for long hair like women's hair uh, if you read song of solomon long beautiful hair is considered seductive so there is going to be a seductive nature to these beings that people are going to be sort of you know put in their tractor beam and you know want be sucked into whatever the agenda is that these beings have and they hate people by the way and they are wanting to they're wanting to torment people they do not like people they hate people but they also need them okay and we're going to see that here in in just a, a minute these watchers want to use humanity but before they use them they are going to abuse them and that's part of what the torture thing is they're going to lure them in and then there it says they have tails like scorpions that sting and they torment people with this sting now, a lot of people make a big deal about the first horse rider, um, you know, the corona and, you know, the, uh, the arrows uh, being a vaccine and so on, and that this is the mark of the beast. Really, if you want to look at something that's closer to being the mark of the beast, it would be what these watchers, what these fallen angels are doing to people. Now... One of the curious things here is that once people are stung, once they've been, you know, stung by this uh, appendage, um, which is symbolic again of these beings, there's going to be something about them that's very attractive that draws people in. Okay, they're not going to look like locusts. These, this is all symbolism that describes. Um, part of their nature and you know how they get around and how many of them there are there are just so many you can you know it looks like a cloud um, that people are going to have this sort of love hate thing with these entities they're kind of people are going to be sucked into this they're going to be stung believers are not though but in fact these entities can't even do that they're not permitted to sting someone who's sealed and of course the sealing is the holy spirit if they have the holy spirit they can't sting them now people who are tormented by these beings uh will wish they could die because there's something about it that is just absolutely horrific whether it's physical mental emotional all the above we don't really know um, but it's going to be really bad, and these people are going to want to die, but they're not going to be able to die. And um, this has been um, a source of questioning and, you know, theories and stuff for people for a long time. Why can't people die? Well, if you've watched some of my other videos or even read my book, A Kingdom of Priests, you'll know what I think about that anyway. And that is that Jesus is the one who holds the keys to death and Hades. He's not going to let them die. Death and Hades are going to be temporarily closed to anybody who is stung. Now, you go you may go, well, why would that be? Why would why would people, you know, why would Jesus do that? Why would he not let these people die? Well, there's a couple of reasons for it. Um, and I think that it's basically redemptive reasons. Uh, one of the things that we need to know is that after uh, the beast begins to reign, that the false prophet's going to come on the scene and he's going to bid the earth dwellers. He's going to enlist the support of earth dwellers to make an image to the beast. Now the beast is a hybrid. He's going to be a resurrected man now indwelt by Apollyon, one of the watchers from the bottomless pit. And when something is made in the image of something else, like we're in the image of Christ as believers, okay, Adam was created in the image of God. This means that we have a resemblance to, or we're, there's something in common. So when we're in the image of Christ, that is, he's going to basically stamp his uh, essence on us. And he does this through the Holy Spirit and as we're being transformed and sanctified. Satan has his version of that too. He, there are going to be people who are in the image of the beast. That is, there are people who are with the cooperation of the earth dwellers. That is, people who love the earth and love the world and love this world system. 
they're going to make it so that there uh, will be a select group of people who will be hybrids. Okay, they'll have lots of um, powers. They're, they'll have um, knowledge. They're going to have uh, all of the you know, assets, basically, of the fallen angels who were so bad that they had to be put in chains in the pit. So the people who are going to be in the image of the beast, this is not going to happen until after the abomination of desolation when the false prophet gets the cooperation of earth dwellers to somehow or another make it possible for these fallen entities to go into humanity without the ill effects, right? Because the watchers, for all that they hate people, at some level, they need people in order to interface with this world. How is this redemptive? <laughs> How is this going to usher in yet another wave of revival? Well, there's this very interesting story in John, I think it's chapter 3, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And what Jesus says is, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. That whoever looks to him basically will be saved. Okay, And then right after that follows John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Back in the day, in the book of Numbers, we read about how the children of Israel were grumbling and God sent fiery serpents to sting them. This was quite the plague. It was really awful. You know, they repented, and then God told Moses, look, make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and put it in the center of the camp so that whoever looks at the serpent will be healed. They won't die. And it is a very peculiar thing that God had Moses do, but Jesus said that basically he was the serpent on the pole. He was the one that the curse was put on him, was placed on him, and that if anybody looks to him, they will be saved because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus became that serpent on a pole, symbolically speaking. So uh, in the Old Testament, this uh, image, this brazen serpent, actually became a source of worship, and eventually it had to be taken down and destroyed because people were using it as an idol. But the point of it all is that there's a redemption for people who are stung, okay? For people who are stung, if they will turn to Christ, if they will look to him, they can be saved, okay? And that will happen even during the time that the pit is open and people are being tormented for five months. All of that will end at the time of first fruits. Satan will be cast out of heaven. The beast will rise from the dead. The fifth seal martyrs will all be in heaven by that point in time. And this is also, first fruits is when the second rapture of the 144,000 takes place. Now, you'll remember that um, in the book of Revelation, we learn that if you worship anybody made in the image of the beast, you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. You're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. If you take the mark of the beast, you'll be thrown into the lake of fire. If you worship the beast or you worship the image of the beast, and by the way, the image of the beast has a power to kill you if you don't worship him. So we know this isn't an idol. This is actually a, these are people who the false prophet gives breath to or spirit, puts the spirit of these entities into select people who somehow or another, uh, with the cooperation of the earth dwellers, um, have something changed or adjusted so that they can actually incorporate this uh, fallen spirit inside of their human body. One of the things that will happen when, once people are being stung by these entities, they're lured in and then tormented, is that they will experience what it's like to live in extreme torment but not be able to die. And that, by the way, is what will happen to anyone who takes the mark of the beast basically from this point on. If they take the mark of the beast, 
they will be thrown into the lake of fire and they're going to be tormented for eternity. Now, these people here who get, you know, tormented by the watchers, it's only going to be for five months or 150 days, but it will be enough for many, many people to get a taste of what the lake of fire is all about. These entities, in addition to enjoying torturing people, may want to jump the gun as far as when they can actually go into a physical body to possess it, to own it. And it's not until after the abomination of desolation, after the sixth trumpet, that this is going to be able to happen. This is when the earth dwellers will do whatever it takes to be able to cause the people to um, safely uh, have these guys indwell them. That won't happen until over on this side here. But at the time of the sixth trumpet, that's when the three angels will be calling out, you know, worship God, worship the creator, the one who made everything and everything in it. And the second thing, uh, the second angel will say is Babylon has fallen, which is really, it's what happens right there. Babylon falls, the harlot has fallen. And the third thing is, is don't take the mark of the beast, don't worship the beast, don't worship the image of the beast, and so on. This great warning, anybody who does that is going to be uh, thrown into the lake of fire and in the presence of God and the holy angels and the Lamb and everybody, they're going to be able to watch their torment forever and ever. This isn't a temporary thing, it goes on forever and ever. So... Because this warning hasn't been issued over on this side, Jesus is going to be very fair and not condemn any of these people to the lake of fire. With full and complete understanding of what they're doing and these angels warning that if you do this, this is the consequence. Before these angels go out and say what the consequence or what the result of taking the mark or having anything to do with the image of the beast or the worship of the beast and so on. If this uh, warning hasn't been issued, uh, Christ is going to keep these people from dying until they have an actual understanding or until, um, you know, they've been warned. So they can't say, well, I was never warned. Nobody told me that this was going to happen. All right. So even though uh, CERN is firing up today, and I think it, it's already fired up, they're not going to open the pit today. That isn't going to happen, although it could happen in November. By that time, we would be gone um, if CERN's opening is attached to the fifth trumpet when the pit is opened. Remember, this is a fifth trumpet thing. This is something that God and Jesus, they're in charge of all of this. It's not going to happen without their authority, without their permission. There may be some kind of uh, distant interface that um, these beings have with humankind right now, whether it's at the quantum level or some other way, but their actual presence here on Earth um, where they influence humanity in a more direct way, that hasn't happened yet. So they're not personally here yet. So um, you've probably seen some little flies uh, flying across my screen here. That's because I live on a farm and it's fly season. Uh, I have a handout for you. Um, the six months following the rapture of kings and priests. So I hope you'll get a copy of that. It's basically the show notes for uh, this video. This is the fourth video in a series. Uh, I hope you will have watched the first three before you watch this one. Otherwise, a lot of the things I'm saying probably will sound a little heretical to you. I also have links to some other videos that you may want to watch that might shed some light on some of the things that I've said in this video today. So leave a comment in the comment section and uh, look forward to hearing from you. And until the next video, I pray you'll have a very, very blessed day.